everybody. Greetings. I'm, I'm excited to be here with my dear friend, Josh Waitskin. I, he is a singular human being. I know of no one who has achieved world-class success at the mental domain of chess and the physical domain of, of martial arts. Um, it's, chess players don't usually make that leap, um, especially not at that level. And, um, but there's also something else that's very singular about Josh, and that is that he's a, a, a student of studying. He's a student of learning. And I had always felt, as a, as a performer myself, that that kind of self-consciousness would interfere with performance. But you and Ted Williams, who wrote The Science of Hitting, are the only two people I know who reflect on performing and perform at a world-class level. Mm. So how do, you, how do you do that? How do you be self-aware and perform at a high level? Well, I'm honored by that framing. Ted Williams was a, was a great. Thanks, Adam. <laughs> uh, it's a pleasure to be here with all of you. It's a great question. Well, I tend to think about the learning process as something that involves an undulation um, between periods of, of deep immersion and, and periods of surfacing and reflection. And similarly, there are moments as, as, an, as a competitor where you're in the fight, just deeply engaged in, in the battle. And then there are moments where you, you surface and reflect. And I think it's important not to confuse the two. I think that sometimes people compromise themselves by surfacing and getting into an academic place when they're in the middle of the battle. One, one way to think about this is a martial artist who might be training as a way of life very, very intensely. If he or she decides they're going to compete, say, two weeks later, something happens. Like their repertoire goes, whoosh, like all the fat becomes exposed by the recognition they're going to compete. And then a day or two before the competition, or three days before the competition, they go, whoosh, Right? And that's appropriate in the learning process because there's an experimental phase. And then as you're getting ready for battle, um, all of the, like the, the, the pressure, the heat, exposes any, any fat, any, any chinks in the armor. And I've harnessed that undulation in my life between periods of intense reflection. So in my chess career, I would have periods where I'd play two or three tournaments in a row. Um, and I was just deeply involved in the fight. And the tournaments were maybe nine, ten days long, so I'd be traveling, I'd be living in Eastern Europe at the time and traveling to Greece for nine days and Amsterdam for ten days and Budapest for ten days. And then I'd come back and I'd do a, an intensive month of study. And so that undulation has been very important for me. Um, and I think it's, I, I've been conscious about not letting one state interfere with the other and having them fuel one another. You, you talk in your book about studying the form to leave the form, yeah. which is, I um, wonder if you could elaborate on that, because you, you have to study, you have to break a domain down to basic <coughs> principles, study those principles, and then, in a sense, you have to leave them behind. There's that great line of uh, Yoda, you must unlearn, Luke, which you have learned. Right. And so you master basic principles, and then you leave them behind. Yeah. You, Supplant them. I think about numbers to leave numbers, form to leave form, yes. as integral to the to the really high level learning process in, in mental and physical disciplines. Um, like so, for example, in a domain like chess, or for example, investing, we we have principles, mental models that we learn, and most people get stuck there. Um, but actually, I would argue that it's it's often more dangerous to to have mental models where you stop there than to have none. Um, because then you're, you're academic again. You're, you're, you're looking at things in this arbitrary way when the world is much more subtle and high level performance is much more subtle. So then you have this, this layer of principles, but then you have the layer beneath of principles which help you navigate those principles. Those are the exceptions of the principles. And the principles right. beneath those, which are the exceptions to the exception of the principles. So the substrata is where the world class performer tends to live most of, most of his or her life, I find. Or the, or the student of the game tends to live right. their life. And so then it's the dissolving of what we might have and, and so part of what that process involves is deep internalization of principles or of technical ideas or of numbers into an intuitive sense of flow. And then a deeper, and then that intuitive sense of flow leads to like the construction of mental models, which then you understand the exceptions of those and that turns into, into flow. And so one, that's one of the reasons why, in my opinion, people are often naive in how they discuss cognitive biases um, or checklists, right? From the outside, it looks like you need to think about each cognitive bias as something separate. But if you're really performing at a world-class level, 
you need to study those biases so deeply and reflect on them with so much nuance that, that they become internalized, chunked into the intuition the same way the technical information can. And right. then you learn to train your body to feel your way through these things. And that's a big way that I operate, is harnessing somatic awareness or physiological introspective sensitivity. And we'll be discussing this later with, with Dr. Lagos. I, I've, I, I've spent a lot of, of time harnessing my physiology as a read, a meter for my intuitive awareness. And my intuitive awareness is how I relate to complexity. One way to describe this is I used to give simultaneous chess exhibitions um, for charity events. And so like a bunch of kids would play a, a tournament and the, the top 40 or so would compete against me. And I had people play chess in many different styles. Um, there's great mathematicians, there's more mu musical players, more abstract players. I'm not a great mathematician. I related to chess around finding hidden harmonies. And I love the battle of chess. And, I, and my strength lay in, in creating or finding this sense of flow or harmony within chaos. And so when I was giving a simul, it was kind of a macro manifestation of what I used to do in a chess game. So in a chess game, I'd be playing a game, and it would be very complex. But I wasn't really thinking of it mathematically. I would just feel flow within the complexity. Right? It would, it would like numbers to leave numbers. Um, giving a simul, it was interesting. I'd be playing 40 boards at once. So Imagine 40 people sitting there and you're walking around and I'd get to one board and they'd make the move and I'd make the move. And then you're going, so each one of those games can be that flow, but then the whole 40 boards would be a feeling, a larger feeling of flow. Um, and then I, I became aware of that because often a kid will try to cheat. You show, you show up to their board and they'll just change the position. And I wouldn't remember what the position was, but the flow was wrong. And then what I could do is I could, like all the, the balls that had been in the air would just fall onto the floor. And I'd realized that, so the flow had been interrupted. And then I'd have to go into the game, and I'd deconstruct the game, and I'd reverse engineer my way back to the position. I could remember the whole game that way. But I never related to, complex, to, to, technical, uh, to technical material technically. I related to it once it had been chunked into that post numbers, leave numbers, of, or form to leave form place. Um, so so yeah. could, you, could you give a, a, an example? I know from chess, for example, you, you a knight is well placed in the center of the board. And yeah. then you learn there are all kinds of exceptions to that. Sometimes it's better off right. on, the, on the rim. Right. And I wonder if you could give an example from, say, martial arts of something, a basic principle that you learn, say, in the first <laughs> few months of, of martial arts training. Sure. And then you have to leave that principle behind. And you realize there are all kinds of exceptions. Right. Right. Well, in all of these arts, the principles are relative, right? And so, I mean. Maybe an interesting way to think about it is, is watching a great basketball player shoot in a state of imbalance, right? Mm -hmm. So like, think about Michael Jordan. I'm sure many of you have seen Michael Jordan's greatest moments of creative inspiration. He, he trained, I mean, you watch Jordan in, you know, in, in, in training and practice, and his flow is so beautiful, and he's, his, his form is so just meticulous, and just thousands and thousands and thousands of reps. And then he can play in a position where you know, you'll watch him imbalanced and just all looking askew. And, but, and, and he's found that flow of correct form. Like he's, just, he's has such a deep relationship to it that he can look externally misaligned. Um, but he's internalized the, the essential core components of good technique, right? And so with fighters, you see, I mean, with martial artists, I mean, you'll see, you'll see boxers practicing body mechanics all the time. But things are rarely textbook because you're fighting an opponent who's trying to crimp you. Right? And so you have to imp improvise your way around things. But the, the, the essence, so this principle I talk about of making smaller circles, right? Like yeah. martial artists are working on body mechanics in big ways, like big font, right? But then over time, they're, they're tightening, the, tightening tight, the circles get tighter, more compressed, more condensed, condensed, condensed. And ultimately, those small circles can manifest in ways that you, like you can hardly see. If you think about Muhammad Ali throwing a punch that seemed to hardly move an inch, right? But it has all that power of that, that condensed, coiled energy. And so if you imagine coiling things that, you know, w w w just relentlessly, then you can do things where that, that might look like the principles aren't, that they're embodying aren't visible to the external eye. And you know, an interesting way to think about this is illusion. Um, magic, right? One of your beautiful words. I have to say, Adam's such an incredible dude. I feel a little silly with him interviewing me. I should be interviewing him, but we're going to do that another time. Another time. Um, in a really wise soul here. If you think about um, the, the training process in, in illusion for, of great illusionists similar, is very similar to martial artists. Um, and the reason uh, I'll speak about the martial arts manifestation of this because I know it much more deeply. 
Um, sometimes a martial artist can do something that looks mystical, right? And it's not mystical. And one way to think about what they're doing is, is through frames, right? If you imagine, if you've been training in the martial arts for two, three years, and I've been training very deeply for 15, 20 years, then you might have two positions, right, that are next to each other. And there's this position that, move, that you move from here to here. But I might spend my whole life in transition. And in between those two positions, I've cultivated maybe 100 frames, right? So think about this, the shutter speed. Your shutter speed is here, but I have all these pockets to play with. And that comes with just tons of repetition and deconstruction and drilling, 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 drilling. Um, Marcelo Garcia, who I own, a dear friend of mine and training partner, who I own a jiu-jitsu school with in, in New York. He's the greatest grappler um, of all time, Brazilian jiu-jitsu and submission grappling. And he's known as the king of the scramble. And if you deconstruct what he does, his life is spent in transition. So he does things that look mystical, but they're not mystical. He's just spent his whole life in the in-between. And so if you think about it that way, you've developed a shutter speed or you've developed an ability to play in frames others can't see. And so if you look externally imbalanced to somebody, it's because you're operating in a, you're able to play in invisible terrain. And that's a lot of what illusionists do. They're just practicing. They're fueled by that intrinsic motivation just to train, train. You see, I, I had this great experience um, having a two-hour conversation with David Blaine last week. And just you're spending time with him. And he loves magic so deeply. He's just never not manipulating the cards and planting cards on you and putting things in your head and preparing for what he's going to do to you in two hours. It's just constant reps. And if you live that way, you can do things that the naked eye can't see. And it's not mystical. It's just fierce dedication to one's art. So psychologists speak of the four stages of learning. First, you're an unconscious incompetent. Then you become conscious of your incompetence. Then you develop a conscious competence. And then ultimately, the goal is an unconscious competence. So how does that play out, say, in, in martial arts? And, and you've recently taken up paddles, paddleboards. Surfing, yeah. Surfing, yeah. yeah. So how is that, where are you in the, in the surfing within that uh, framework? Well, consciousness usually locks up competitors, in my observation. Right, but well, that's what right. I led with. Yeah. Right, I mean, it's, it's very interesting. So you, have, like, you often have young talents who are just ripping on something. And then they, like, for me, when I was 17, 18 years old, and I started to think about existential questions and reflect on the absurdity of having spent the last decade plus of my life just in 64 squares. Like that kind of view made my worldview getting complicated, complicated my relationship with chess. It compromised my free flow, right? And I think about the post-consciousness competitor. Um, most people stop at that point, right? Because then they, they have to deal with the crisis, the complexity that emerges from that more, more sophisticated worldview. And if they work through all of that, then you come to this post-consciousness competitor. And that passage is I mean, I, I work with people on that passage. It's a big part of, of what I do. And it, it's, it's, it's sort of, you want to reach the, like that place which taps the, 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 the post-conscious manifestation or version of, of being inhibitionless, right? Of being that, that, you know, that freedom that children have, that, that la lack of a fear of falling, losing, right? Um, that is absolutely wild love for learning. Um, that freedom can be reattained after one has traveled that murky space, right? Um, and so for me, I'm taking on this new art now, paddle surfing. So I'm, I'm, I spent the last three years, this is um, pat, st surfing, um, but on, so stand up paddleboard, you're standing on a paddleboard that's, you're, you basically are dropping leaders on the board all the time. It's my friend, and trainer Eric Antonson uses the language race to the bottom. And so basically, if you're, if you're on a board that you can stand on without being in the zone, the board's too big for you, and you're, so you're constantly shrinking it. Um, and then you're, you're, but you're, st you're on this very small, high-performance paddleboard, and you're surfing big waves. And I'm, I've never been more in love with a sport and art in my life. I'm just all in on this thing. Um, but still, where are you within the framework? Well, I'm, I'm, in, I'm in an interesting place where it depends what part of surfing you're talking about. So if we're talking about small to medium-sized waves that involve, involve a lot of technical mastery on turns, um, I'm, I'm conscious. I'm very conscious. But if you talk about, it's interesting, like I, I'm, if the waves are bigger and you're just dropping into waves and ripping on high lines and it takes essentially courage, um, a certain kind of technical ability, but it's essentially kinesthetic presence, feeling the wave, dropping in with full commitment, and, and just ripping. Um, so it's technically, it's, it's, it's actually harder for most people, but kind of the training that I've done in my life allows me to do that. So in <coughs> certain waves, I can get into a, a beautiful just free flow state. 
Um, other, it depends on the way, how the waves are. And I'm, I'm, one thing that I'm careful about when I take on a new discipline is not bringing in other arts too soon, right? So thematic interconnectedness is, is the core of what I do. Um, and I think a core part of, of how I approach learning is taking the principles or the essence of one discipline and transferring it to another, right? That's how I transferred from chess to the martial arts. Um, but for example, when I transferred, when I started moving from Chinese martial arts, um, Tai Chi push hands into Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, I was cautious. I, I was careful of, of the dangers of not learning the, some of the technical side of Jiu Jitsu in its own language and, and too quickly bringing over the Tai Chi. So you have to learn the language of a discipline, um, the technical information of a discipline. And then you get to this place where you're operating in the higher order principles, and that's where everything is, is connected. Um, and so I'm, I did that with, with, with the movement from push hands to jiu-jitsu, and then I started, once I reached a high enough level, all of the transfer of my level from chess and tai chi came over. I'm not quite there yet with push So it's, my learning curve is accelerated by it, um, but I feel like I'm right on the cusp. I think in like, I'm about to do a six month surge of moving my family down to the, the jungle right on the Pacific Ocean, and I'm gonna have six months of six hours a day on the water. I think it's like I, I can feel the breakthrough in my fingertips is, is happening. Well, speaking of thematic interconnectedness, I can see the the uh, after all, chess is a is one of of conflict, and and you have an <coughs> opponent. Yeah. Same with martial arts, yeah. whether it's push hands or Brazilian jiu jitsu. Yeah. But the water is really not an opponent, right? Yeah. It's not. So, what is the thematic? How is it that you came to choose? Yeah. Surfing. Yeah, I spent three no, decades fighting humans. Yeah. And now and you're now I'm receiving the essence of the ocean. If you try to fight the ocean, she'll just destroy you. So it, it's beautiful. It's much more about the art of receptivity. I, um, I, and I love, I feel that, this, that what I'm, the training in this art is also consistent with where I am in, in my life. Um, since I had my, I, I have two boys, Jack and Charlie, and um, they're just the light of my lives. Jack is, when I, and when I had Jack, Adam and Jack are great friends, and Adam has taken on Jack as an apprentice, which is like the most overqualified, like conceptual math. I'm not sure what we'd call you ever, <laughs> but um, like my when I had Jack, my my relationship to fighting changed. I didn't want to fight humans anymore. It just happened overnight. Um, and I, so this is essentially the art of receptivity for me, and so receiving what the ocean has to give studying the ocean, just balancing the ocean, standing on the ocean and feeling, absorbing every ripple. Um, so it doesn't feel like I'm competing against it. It takes just as much intensity as anything I've ever, and it's just as much danger and it's all in, and it's wild dropping in on these monster waves. It's full commitment, but it's, it's a receptive energy more than anything else. So one of the themes in your book, and indeed I know this in your life, is, yeah. is these disciplines, these domains, are a means of self-discovery and yeah. self-exploration. Yeah. So, would you say that you've taken up surfing now as a, as a, to explore other parts of yourself as opposed to yeah. the martial side? Absolutely. Absolutely. And that's been consistent with how, when I moved from chess into Tai Chi push hands, it was, it wasn't, it was, it was because I needed to, I was studying myself. I, I had been competing since I was six years old in the chess world. Um, I don't need to tell the whole story of it because it's, it's, it would take a while, but the last few years of my chess career became much more complex. I moved away from this self-expression, from this just pure love of the game, and I moved into this place where I was, this film came out about my life, and I had a, which was complicated for me. Um, and then I had a trainer who urged me to, as opposed to just express the core of my being through what I, through, through my art, study the players who are the opposite of me. Um, not what would Josh play here, but what would Karpov play here, what would Petrosian play here, brilliant, brilliant chess players but who were just constructed differently than me, much more cold-blooded, prophylactic, conservative players. And I was a hot-blooded, aggressive, um, wild player. And I moved away from my love for the game, and I moved into Tai Chi, um, really out of my study of East Asian philosophy, of Taoist philosophy, Buddhist philosophy. And it was a search for, for self and a, search, and a search for, for a return to the love. Um, and it was Tai Chi meditation initially, and then I moved from that organically into the, the, the heat of, of the martial arts. And in many ways, that was also because I, I had reached a meditative state that had deeply healed some of the, the, the wounds of being alienated from my first love, which was chess. But from that meditative state, it's not really my style to just sit in the flower garden. I wanted to test that 
meditative state under increasing heat. So let's see if you can stay in that meditative state, Josh, you know, while people are trying to rip your head off. You know, and then increase the pressure, increase the heat, increase the heat. I really believe in that in life. Dynamic quality, not just sitting. I think a lot of times people get into a certain place and they, like, they have success and then it becomes a rut they get stuck in. But I believe in pushing my boundaries as a way of life. And so that's, I think that my, my search for my edge and for my own development, I would say spiritual development, um, has been really what's guided many of these transitions in my life. I should explain that, that Josh, at a certain point, took on a trainer who did not uh, recognize Josh's natural affinities, predispositions, genius uh, for chess, and tried to mold you in a different way. Into his mode of chess. Right, right. exactly. So, which brings me to a really interesting point, and, 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 and I would like you to address this, and, and that is how does an individual choose the right teacher, yeah, the right beautiful. master? Because the wrong coach or the wrong master, sensei, yeah. can, can cost you years of your life. Yeah. I mean, it, it cost you chess. Yeah. And so how, how does an individual, I mean, after all, for me to choose the right teacher, the right coach, the right master, I have to know myself. But I don't know myself yet, so how, yeah. how does one choose a teacher? Yeah, it's it great. be question. a book just on that, choosing the right teacher. Yeah, it's such an elemental question. And I, I just want to say, I'll dig, let's dig into that, but I, I will say that I actually look back on all the forces that led to my alienation from chess as a great gift, ultimately, because it, it complicated my worldview and led to what I'm doing today, and I'm so ecstatic for it. And if, uh, otherwise, maybe I would have just, just rolled on in that direction for a long time without being forced sure. to reflect and to deepen and to study the world. I think that um, it's such a great question, Adam. And... I don't want to give an oversimplistic answer, but I think that in deciding who one is going to take on as a mentor or a coach or a sensei or a teacher, we need to feel that person's ability to feel us, right? The vast majority of teachers teach the way they learn, right? Whether you're talking about math teachers or chess teachers or fight teachers, anything. They have their way of learning, and so they teach all their students to learn that way. But that, by def definition, will alienate maybe 75% of the students, right? Which is part of the tragedy of the education system. Teachers teach one way, their way, and most of the kids are left, left behind. And so the, the, the first thing I would say is that we, we want to find the teacher who listens first. So I train people. That's what I, a big part of what I do. And 99-plus percent of what I do is listen, right? And I don't mean just listening... When we, when we have dialogue, I mean study them, right? Through, through my observation of them, through reading their journals, through setting their biometrics, through dialogue with consultants who I have them working with, physical trainers, um, um, psychologists perhaps, um, Dr. Lagos, um, who's an HIV biofeedback specialist, and get the insights from, from like every place that I can on the essence of what's happening with that person. Um, I have my own diagnostics process that it, begin, that it begins with. And I just try to feel someone very deeply. And the, and the essence of how I think about learning is the movement toward unobstructed self-expression. If that's our goal, frictionlessness, right? Unobstructed self-expression, bringing out the core of who we are through our art. Then we want to find a teacher who is going to help us along that path of self-discovery and won't have ego about it, right? Not be putting themselves up as the one who is forming you. And often the most important thing for a teacher to do is to get out of the way, right? Some of the, the best things that I've done working with people have been moments where I've just done nothing. Um, but a lot of work went into the decision to do nothing. Um, and often you see teachers just saying way too much and overloading people and dumping their baggage on people. Um, and I, I think a lot of it also is, you know, that attunement that I'm describing is, is so critical because you want someone to be living at their stretch point, right? You want someone, like if, if we're here, we want someone to be able to stretch for here. They can't stretch for there, but like what can they just barely reach? And if we live our life at our stretch point and we're all in, in dedication to just being at our stretch point and we're embracing dynamic quality versus static quality and we're not sinking into the ruts of where we were before or past successes, but we're, then, then it's unbelievable what can happen, right? And so... Like, I think of an ideal relationship between a mentor and apprentice as a shared intrinsic motivation, um, a, shared a, shared a shared love for the art of what they're doing together. Um, 
I'm also allergic to the armchair professor type who teaches people to do something without doing it themselves. Um, I think that if you're going to be training world-class competitors, you have to be challenging yourself at the same level of intensity that you would hope they do. Um, because the razor's edge, like when you're talking about really high level, I'm answering your question sort of as it relates to high level training as well, right? Yes. At, at the razor's edge of decision making or competitive or athletics or anything, often the greatest insight is right next to, the, to a blunder, right? And if you're an academic looking at the outside, you're gonna give that steer too wide a berth around that, right? But if you're in there and if you're just living, if you're pushing yourself um, to your like outer reaches, as a way of life, and, and like you're in the fire as a way of life, then you can, you can, you can dance on that edge with somebody, right? But if you don't, then it, the moments that are most important for them, um, you'll like you, you'll be you'll be blunt, you'll be academic, you'll miss it, you won't feel where they are in that in the most critical moments of their life. So I think that that a teacher who's all in, um, all in on you, all in on their own self development, who listens first, um, who's attuned, who's a deep empath or at least has the capacity to be technically empathic. I also think it's important not to quickly um, just throw ourselves into the hands of someone as a guru, right? I, I, don't, I don't have a guru, I don't believe in that. Like I've, I've, I've been there in life and explored it. And I, we can, I think that it's important to understand there are some things that we can learn from somebody um, that are extremely valuable, but not, it might not be everything. And they, right. might, they might be wrong. And the last thing I'll say is I think that it's very important to find a mentor who we intuit will let us go at the right time. You're speaking as an adult. I'm, what about a child and a parent who has a child and is considering taking up football or chess or yeah. ballroom dancing or figure skating, whatever it is? How does the parent know? How, how would that, that process go? I mean, how would you, for example, find a, a coach for Jack? I, I think mean, you had me for, right? for, right. for math, but, right. but how... How would you I, find I, think, I think the first things I'd look for would be someone who would study Jack, who would be deeply attuned to him, like you, who would feel the essence of his mind before throwing stuff at him, um, and who would maintain that attunement, who would be dynamic about that attunement, um, and who wouldn't have ego about it, right? and who wouldn't jam their modality of learning. And also I think that you have to have a high enough level of technical mastery to be flexible. So if, if I'm a chess teacher at this level and I'm taking, teaching someone who's at this level right next to me, I can't teach them so many ways, but if I'm a good enough player to work with somebody, um, if, I, if I've really you know, reached a level where like, my apprentice is, it has a lot of, to learn from me, I'm a much higher level, then I can teach them in many ways. Right? So deep, I, I'd look for, for deep mastery, attunement, love of the journey, um, and not someone who's just out for short-term results. And also, a long, I also, one thing I'll say is, for Jack, I would look for somebody who, and I think this is very important when we choose teachers for our children, someone who will teach the art in a way that will inspire a love of process as opposed to just quick results, right? Because we, we, wanna, we want our children to learn about life through whatever it is that they're studying as opposed to learning about just that thing. Like, if people say chess is good for children, chess, in my opinion, is not good for children. Chess can be magnificent for children or destructive to children depending on how it's learned. And you can have some chess teachers who give people a relationship to chess from a very young age where they, they're learning about life every day and it's exquisite. And you have other people who are just being boxed into this kind of fixed theory of intelligence. They're memorizing openings. They're memorizing their way to winning. They're being told that they're geniuses, and so they, they, they can't take on real challenges when, when they're really stretched because they're brittle. Um, so these are all principles that I'd be factoring in. But so attunement is the essence of it. It's interesting you should say that because I remember it's been many years since I, I left the education field, but I would always begin the first session, the first 15, 20 minutes, asking the student to tell me about him or herself. What are you interested in? What, what are your pursuits? Yeah. And then I would, the metaphors that I would use would be framed around a domain they already right. knew. Right. Um, I love it. So, so I'm, you, you bring up the notion of fixed intelligence versus incremental intelligence. Yeah. And I'd like to explore that because then I want to go into investing in loss. Yeah. Um, so I wonder if you could explain the distinction between fixed intelligence right. and incremental intelligence, right. and there are two views of intelligence yeah. that... Okay, so just quick, quick yeah. like, developmental psychology background on this. So, and a lot of this came from, initially from the work of, of Carol Dweck, who's a really interesting developmental psychologist. Um, if you think about fixed or entity theories of intelligence versus a mastery-oriented or incremental theory of intelligence, very often parents or coaches believe that they're buoying a, a child's confidence by telling the boy or girl that 
they're brilliant or they're a genius or they're so smart at this or they're excellent at math, like intuitively. Um, and so, so feedback that's focused on an ingrained level of ability will tend to inspire a fixed intelligence. Well, feedback that's focused on the learning process, on, on, on the struggles that they had to go through to reach a certain level will tend to, in, to, to help a child internalize a much more resilient mastery oriented or incremental theory of intelligence. And you know, if you tell a kid that they're winning because they're brilliant or because they're smart, um, then when they're losing, it must be because they're dumb, right? That's just the inverse of it. And so that works very well. And so what you see all the time in chess, chess world is most talented kids are told how brilliant they are, but they actually are ducking tough competition, right? Because they want to protect that perf perfectionism. Well, people who are, who are just have receiving feedback, which is incremental, which is appraising, I'm so proud of how hard you worked before that math test or before that you know, music recital. And, and so the, the, the praise or the criticism is about process, right? Then process becomes, we're empowered by an understanding of the fact that, that we can work harder and take ourselves on and accomplish anything. And there's been so much interesting work, and you can look up studies on, on how this manifests. It's pretty jolting how, how serious it is, and, a lot, and it's a big problem with, with parenting. Well-meaning parents will often put like a fixed entity theory of intelligence on their children by praising their genius as opposed to focusing on process. So someone who had a fixed notion of intelligence would be unwilling to invest in loss. Yeah. Which is a fascinating concept. I wonder if you could explain it briefly. Investing in loss. Right. Well, investing in loss is, I mean, there's so much there, but essentially we have to, like if we're pushing our limits as a way of life, we are, like, we're going to, to lose, right? And, and it's interesting. Like when I started playing chess, I was, when I was seven, eight, I started playing almost all, all against adults, right? And, and so other kids my age I was beating in national championships and city state championships, world championships. Those are the only times I played kids. Otherwise I was playing as adults, so I was always at my stretch point. And so I actually, like I was the top rated player in the country, but I, I lost probably more games than I won um, because I was stretching at my stretch point all the time. And I think that Investment loss means just that. It means in investing in, in the learning process. Similar if you have a power zone as a martial artist or as an investor or as a mathematician or a philosopher or anything. You can spend your life just protecting your power zone or you can expand it incrementally as a way of life. Every time you expand it, you're experimenting. You're playing at a lower level. So if, if, if I'm in, at my jiu-jitsu school and someone comes in who's a lower level than me um, and I'm, like, I can just beat that guy up, um, but if I'm playing with an experimental part of my repertoire, he might be able to challenge me um, when he wouldn't otherwise. And if my ego gets big and I need to just show him I'm dominant, then I'm inhibiting my, my learning curve, right? So ego gets in the way of everything. So if you, it's interesting when you think about in terms of jiu-jitsu. When you watch people go into most jiu-jitsu schools, if you go watch, you, you'll see a lot of static play. You'll see people... Like there's the guard, which is this like fight for advantage, and then someone passes the guard, which means they basically get around the legs, and then they'll, they'll hold the dominant position, right? And so, so much of jujitsu training um, is holding dominance once you achieve it, right? But in fact, 90 something percent of the jujitsu game, what really matters is, is that state of dynamic equilibrium, the guard, right? Playing in that state. Um, or playing in transition, releasing an opponent, letting them move and getting used to transition, but then you're not dominating. So if you have the mindset of just have to go in and dominate every day, then you're actually inhibiting your learning curve because you're, you're stuck, you're static, versus letting someone move, going, playing in the positions that really matter, expanding your repertoire, you're going to often get beat up by guys who you're better than, but you're on a steeper learning curve. And so when I think about someone in anything, I'm not thinking about how good they are, I'm looking at how steep their learning curve is. And if, you, if you're much weaker than somebody else, but you're on a steeper learning curve, you're going to overcome them inevitably in anything, and it's true with teams as well. Like I want a team on a world-class growth curve, and that's what matters most. So to achieve excellence, yeah. one of the sort of counterintuitive notions that you have is the beginner, most people seek to avoid pain and discomfort. Yes. And after you've achieved some level of mastery, you learn to ignore the pain. But Josh seeks it out and embraces the pain. Yeah. Right? So how do you... How do you do that? I mean, that's so counterintuitive. I can tell you I mean, how I did it the last couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> so the last couple of days, we got a, a couple of great guys here, um, Brandon Powell and, and Luke, who came, came from, the U, from the U.S. this last couple of days. And we've been doing, with some teams I have here, um, really intense ice training. So breath work based on this Wim Hof method. And then um, 
ice plunges in like 32, 30, like just temperature that, like water that's basically ice, just above frozen. And, you know, five minute plunges building to 10 minutes tomorrow in um, just water, ice up to here, you know, like that's an example of pushing one's limits, right? Because your whole body screams, get out of this, but you, you learn to put your mind in a certain place and put your breath ahead of your shivers and you, you're fully focused and you're, you're, you're living on the other side of pain, right? This principle of living on the other side of pain, right? Everyone is ducking that stretch point um, as a way of life and that's why most people are mediocre at what they do. Um, but it actually gives us a tremendous opportunity if we want to be excellent to live at our stretch point, but often there's pain. And pain can be physical pain or it can be mental resistance, right? And so what can we do to train to change our relationship to discomfort so that it's something that we, we crave? Like our growth edge is something we hunger for as opposed to hide from, right? People are trying to control things and have everything be just so so they're not taking a risk. What if we learn to love the risk, right? Love our stretch point. Love the pain that comes with having a weakness exposed. What if you give me feedback that exposes a weakness of mine instead of my feeling defensive? You gave me the greatest gift in the world, right? That's a form of pain. And so I, I believe in this principle of thematic interconnectedness. And so one thing that I do is I train relentlessly in, like, I, I don't want to get static about my relationship to discomfort. And so I'm always seeking out ways of, of pushing my limits on it so that I, I never stop craving that dynamic edge. Um, and I think that it's interesting because we can train at living on the other side of pain, you know, in countless ways. Um, but then we can visualize it throughout the rest of our life and so we can, we can have one or two core habits like ice plunging and then visualize this manifestation throughout our whole life. Um, and then we're craving our resistance point and our growth curve goes through the roof. So I know Dr. Lagos has got to come out. Yeah. I, I, my final question is, is the great film director, Akira Kurosawa, yes. at the age of 80, received an honorary lifetime achievement award handed out by Spielberg and Lucas. And he said he was, at the age of 80, mind you, one of the cinematic greats, said he was just getting the hang of directing. Yeah. Just, just beginning to get the hang of, of it. And he said he, was, he didn't feel he had earned the, the, the Academy Award, but he would use it as an inspiration that one day he might merit it. Right. So where are you in that process? Where are you? I felt are you that, getting the hang of things? Uh, I felt that way about two and a half minutes into the ice plunge today. <laughs> I mean, it's interesting. I'm a, I'm a complete beginner. I'm a relative beginner in the art that I'm taking on now. And I love being a beginner, right? It's been a couple of years. But like I, I, I think I am. Um, and there's something so humbling about that state. And I, I love that place. Like, I don't really love hanging out at the top of a discipline. I love the learning process. And, and, um, and so I think, but you're asking me more, where am I as a learner? Yes. Right? <laughs> well, I have my... I, I, so where am I as a learner and where am I as a trainer of people with what I understand about learning? Is one way I could frame that. And I have, I have my strengths and I have my weaknesses. Um, I think I'm a, I'm a, you know, I'll tell you an example of a, of a growth edge for me, right? So I have sometimes difficulty empathizing with someone who doesn't push themselves as a way of life or take on their weaknesses, right? So then I deconstruct why. So when I started playing chess when I was six years old, I, um, I was pretty, I had a feel for the game. And when I was seven, I was the top rated player in the country for my age. And so what, a dynamic emerged where all the other kids, like I was the top guy, everyone was aiming at me, but all the kids have coaches who are very strong level masters, international masters, grandmasters. And so any weakness of mine that came out, um, it wasn't just being looked at by the kids, it was looking at their coaches and they were dr drilling them on how to beat me with that weakness. So if I didn't take on a weakness, um, there was pain, right? I would get beaten up until I did. And when I did, the growth curve, like the pleasure of the growth curve was just, was a reward, right? And so I think that what, one thing that led to, after decades of living that way, is it being some, I realized this last year, it's a little bit outside of my conceptual scheme on an emotional level to not take on my weaknesses. And so sometimes I have difficulty empathizing with someone who isn't. Um, and so that's an example of, 
that's one example of many of like a growth edge that I'm working on. Um, and and so like I I, I could give you th and, and I could go into this like I, I I'm always thinking about where are my con false constructs, where are my biases, where are my false assumptions, um, where where are my blind spots based on like the weird life that I lived. And when I'm working with other people and I'm, I'm really practicing the art of attunement, and of course, I'm part of what I'm thinking about in the surfing is that actually that's the art that is the art of receptivity, which is the meta skill that I need to deepen as a way of life in my work with other humans, right? So I'm taking that on. Um, but I have many weaknesses. That was one of them. I have tons. I've got so much to learn. I mean, I'm, I'm just getting started with parenting as well. I mean, my kids teach me every day how much of a novice I am in the learning process. But I'm, I'm working on it. Yeah. Um, hey, man, this is such a beautiful conversation. We could talk Thanks. all day. We could talk um, all day. But let's shift this. Yeah, let's bring Dr. Lagos. Um, Dr. Lagos, do you want to? Would you like to come out? Um, um, so we've been working dynamically together for some time, collaborating. And. Um, I thought an interesting way to, to frame the dialogue is around the training of, of somatic awareness. Um, a big part of, of, so I've been using the language of thematic interconnectedness. Um, and for example, Adam's first question was about, I could relate to it as chunking complexity or numbers to leave numbers, form to leave form. A, a lot of what I, what I think about is um, harnessing the body um, for high level mental work, right? Decision making, creativity. And w one of the most critical parts of the learning process in anything is a feedback loop. Um, you know, it's easy to have a feedback loop in the martial arts because you do something wrong, someone, you know, punches you in the face or breaks your arm or chokes you out. Like, you, you get a quick, pretty quick feedback loop. Um, in, in deep internal skills like meditation or, or developing an awareness of the body, it's very difficult. Um, and, and so there's one chapter of my book called Building Your Trigger, which is the chapter that I would rewrite. Um, and the reason I would rewrite it is largely um, because of some of the experiences I've had with Dr. Lagos and observing her work around um, building triggers for peak performance states with biofeedback, um, specifically heart rate variability biofeedback. She's such a brilliant um, specialist in this field and also an extraordinary empath. And, and so I, I, I thought um, it would be interesting just to frame this initially around how one can harness a feedback loop in the subtle art of building somatic awareness. Um, so maybe you could tell us a little bit about what HRV is, what you're measuring, and, and how it connects to somatic awareness. Sure. So HRV is the interplay of oscillations in heart rate that actually occur in between each heart rate contraction. So I'll show you just a, a little picture just to illustrate my point. There we go. Uh, the top picture is someone with normal healthy HRV. And what you see are ocean-like waves, these large oscillations that reflect the ability to flexibly respond to stress in the moment. It means you can amplify your heart rate and you can bring it down systematically and congruently in, uh, and, in and across difficult and stressful situations. But on, in the converse, people who have difficulty managing stress, it's, it's actually called autonomic dysfunction is the clinical condition. There's two parts, your little quick lesson about the autonomic nervous system. There's two parts of the autonomic nervous system, the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. Ideally, we want them to be in balance. But in people with clinical anxiety conditions or autonomic dysfunction, the sympathetic nervous system is stuck up here. And originally, it was thought that if we just brought down the sympathetic nervous system, we could relax. But in the last 20 years, we found it's actually the braking system that we want to train, because it will unconsciously, even when you're not activating breathing, and we'll talk that in a minute, in a minute help to regulate your, your balance and bring you back to homeostasis. So what we see here is someone, again, with beautiful large HRV. And, and large HRV is something that peak performers need so that they can flexibly respond in the moment. It helps to clear the mind. It also helps them to stay calm under pressure. Here we see someone with autonomic dysfunction. It could also be someone who doesn't sleep, insomnia, someone who has 
hypervigilant all the time, can't turn off their busy brains. And we often see the minimized erratic HRV, up and down. We also see it's reduced. Low heart rate variability is associated with a smaller range of emotional functioning with, with someone who oftentimes can experience stress but not let it go efficiently and effectively <coughs> such that it affects their ability to function at their optimal level. So HRV biofeedback is centered around optimizing those heart rate waves. So how do you use this to train someone to increase what I'd call their somatic awareness or their physiological introspective sensitivity? So in order to increase somatic awareness, a lot of people think, well, if I focus on my body, warming my hands, and that's a piece of it, but there's a key precursor to it, which is learning to let go, to physiologically allow your body to get back into that homeostasis on demand. Until you can achieve that effectively, it's very difficult to really optimize your somatic awareness. It's as if the body inhibits or at least reduces the ability to add more feeling until it knows it can let go of feeling or excess emotion. Okay, so, so in, my, in my observation of, in my experience of your training, um, so, so for example, if someone is learning how to meditate, they will, they can be sitting there in meditation and they, their mind can raise up and they might be thinking about some random stuff for like <laughs> eight minutes before they realize that they're thinking. Yeah. And, they, and then they, they return to breath, right? So it's a, it's a, big, it's a, it's a, it's a big circle. Um, I've observed with your work um, that you can, you can use biofeedback to train people to notice just the, beginning, the beginnings of the slip out of resonance or out of... Yes. So can you describe the way you use feedback, you use HRV to give someone a feedback loop in the training? Um, how does it actually work? What does it look like? So we have a, a, an actual biofeedback screen and I'll bring it up to show you. So this is an actual biofeedback screen. If you were to come into my office in Manhattan, and, and sit with me. And, and what we have here is actual information about your physiology. And, and based on this information, the, the computer program actually lets you know when you're in resonance. Well, what is resonance? Resonance is a physiological state often correlated with flow. It's when your attention uh, increases, muscle tension decreases, anxiety decreases, and mood increases. And it's depicted here with the red line is, is heart rate and the blue line is respiration. When those two occur simultaneously, so the ocean-like waves occur together, that is physiological resonance, allowing all of the systems in the body to become aligned. And we actually have a little green light, it's not on now, but that indicates resonance. So it's, it's a training that I do for, and it takes a few sessions for people to actually identify when they're able to turn the green, green light on to achieve resonance. And then I'll ask resonance for one person uh, may be very different from another person. And off, often people will say to me, well, I recognize when I'm re in resonance when my mind clears, when my, the thoughts just disappear. But for another person, it could be muscle tension. They feel their muscles relax. So, so we spend time identifying the specific feeling that they associate with their flow state or, or the resonance state. So, so this theme of stress and recovery is so critical for peak performers. And, mm -hmm. I've, and I've observed a... I mean, a pattern over the years. I remember, for me, one of my biggest breakthroughs in chess came when I realized that if I didn't think while my opponent thought, I played at a much higher level. So as opposed to sitting for six hours like, mm -hmm. like a laser, um, I'd make a decision, I'd get up, I'd walk away from the board, and I'd refresh, right? Um, and then someone would make their decision, and I'd sit down, and I'd think. So I was actually spending less time thinking, but at a much higher level of quality. Um, and similarly, I, I used to take notes on how long each one of my my thought processes were, and I, and I would see, like a, once I got past 13 and a half minutes or so, the quality of the thinking would just start to dissipate, right? But what I had to go through to, to gain that kind of insight, um, it, was, it was like doing it all just by rote, right? By experience, by trial and error. So with, I, I'm curious, I, when, when, you just, when you work with somebody, how long, maybe you could describe how long it takes for someone to develop an awareness of when they're in that optimal performance state and when they're beginning to slip. And, and, and what, what does it feel like to them when they start to become aware of, of the slip? It depends on the person. And everyone has, a di everyone has a different type of physiological response to stress. Some people are people that perspire. Other people are cardiovascular responders. Cardiovascular responses are actually the most common. 
There is a certain type of cardiovascular responder that I call physiologically gifted, because if I give them a stress test, having them count backwards by, the, by seven, 100 minus seven, minus seven, minus seven, or I have them actually engage in the Stroop test, I will monitor about seven different physiological signals to identify what kind of responder they are. But with, with physiologically gifted responders, you see this massive cardiovascular response that most people have a cardiovascular response to jump of about 20 beats per, per minute. So let's say your baseline HR, your heart rate is 60, that under stress it jumps to 80. But <coughs> people who are physiologically gifted have this large jump. It can be 30 to 40 beats, about twice the cardiovascular response. And it tells me a little something about how deep they feel. Um, and, and that's something that we can train through the biofeedback. So you'll work differently with each client based on, on, on how naturally attuned they are to their internal sensation. Absolutely. And some people will be very attuned to busy brain, is what I call it, CEO brain, yeah. where, where they have this beautiful mind that can think on multiple levels, but they just can't turn it off. Yeah. Um, and so that will become, a, even though we're, we're using the breathing, the ability to turn the mind on and off will become a key, critical piece of our training. So Adam and I were, were talking quite a bit about what, what I call thematic interconnectedness. And I, I think that one of the most exciting meta skills to develop as a learner is the ability to take something that we cultivate here and cross it like through the rest, like throughout our whole life. Just that the, the web just explodes with growth whenever we have a leap. Um, and I, I really enjoy harnessing the physical to train the mental. And, and I've, I've been doing this myself for a lot of years and now I do it when I work with people. Um, and, and one way that I think about this is that people are usually pretty well calloused over in their areas of strength. Um, and, and so it's sometimes hard to go straight at like a weakness deeply embedded in what someone is best at. But you can, you can take on, like if someone's a, like really controlling in their, in, their, in their work environment, it's difficult to get there. But if you take it on in some other arena, um, then you can get to the root of the, of the theme and then you can cross it over everywhere. And it can be really exciting. And so maybe you can describe this the, the way we harness this physical training, physiological training, um, to unleash the brain. So what, what's the impact of HRV training um, and deepening our attunement to our heart, to our body, um, on, on mental performance? Okay. So two pieces. Uh, the, the first piece I just wanted to tap into, which, which is using the physiological to address the psychological, that, that we can actually address psychological themes like difficulty letting go of control or being a perfectionist through the physiological. My belief, and, and it's, it's been studied empirically th throughout literature, is that experiences aren't just held in your mind. They're imprinted on your, psycho on your physiology, on your heart. Um, and, and we're able to actually maneuver or shift heart rate patterns to help you let go of things like trauma or even to teach the heart, which is a muscle, how to prepare in advance for a specific known stressor. Uh, I worked with an Olympian um, for the last Olympics. We worked on preparing her for, for her first competition and, and had a specific protocol to do so through the breathing. But, but what this does is we can target specific psychological themes and then address them through the physiological pathway. And there's, there's an actual physiological explanation for it in that the heart is innervated uh, by the vagus nerve. The vagus nerve runs from the midbrain all the way through the heart, all the way down to the digestive tract. So even though you're breathing, you're, you're able to innervate many different systems along the autonomic nervous system through the vagus nerve all through the breath by putting yourself in resonance. And there's a study that just came out uh, for my colleagues at Rutgers. And, and what they found was we're generating what's called 0.1 hertz, which is, um, which is technically the resonant state in the heart when respiration and heart rate are aligned. And they measured through MRIs what was happening in people's brain after five minutes of breathing at resonant frequency. And what they found was was very interesting, but somewhat expected when we think of the vagus nerve, just transmitting these signals all throughout the body for alignment, is that you would see 0.1 hertz in specific areas replicated all throughout the brain. Um, so, so there are specific cognitive effects that are known from this. This isn't just a process of relaxation. Um, people in the business world oftentimes 
come to me to use this technique to clear their busy mind, to increase attention and focus, even improve cognitive processing speed. So w one more question. So I, I, one of the, the meta skills that I really enjoy using in the learning process is what I call, what I call fire walking. Mm -hmm. And, and um, one way to think of this is, is that people tend to be reasonably good at learning from their own experiences but they are not terribly good at learning from other people's experiences. So like a martial arts analogy is that, it, let's say someone goes to Mundial's, the world championship in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and they overextend their arm and they get arm barred. And it's like that someone's legs are over them, their arms breaking, their elbows popping, and then maybe it pops. And like, okay, so that person's probably not gonna overextend their arms so much next time, all right? Because <laughs> they just lost a world championship match and got their arm ripped off. Um, but someone watching it, you know, didn't, they weren't there. They, they, didn't, they, they weren't there emotionally. They weren't so much engaged. Their physiology didn't change. It wasn't like a deeply imprinted thing. Um, but if we, can harn, if we can learn from other people's mistakes with the same physiological intensity, mm -hmm. that we, then we can learn from our own. It's unbelievable how that unleashes the learning process. And, and, and this is true in, in physical arenas. It's true in, in mental disorders. So for example, imagine that you're an investor who's grown up in a bull market, like many have today and never experienced a 2008-like market, well then you're going to have all these biases that are connected with just living your whole investment life in the bull market. But then if you have the ability to, to firewalk a bear market, to experience it physiologically, not just intellectually, I, I think that the movement from, from intellectual knowledge into deeply internalized physical knowledge is critical. Um, then imagine how that unleashes you and how it avoids you, like you can avoid falling into terrible holes um, and having your arm broken. And, and so I'm curious, like we, we've had some fun playing with this firewalking principle where I've brought people to you th with, with examples of things I thought would be interesting with firewalk. So maybe you could describe how you can ha combine visualization with biofeedback um, to have someone embody an experience they haven't had before and, and, experience, and, and, and have it imprinted with, with, with physiological um, mm -hmm. reality. So I'll give you an example of an athlete preparing for a specific sports competition. Let's say they're a tennis player and, and uh, preparing for the US Open. And, and so what we'll do is we'll actually change this picture to, it, it, it depends on the person, we may use a past performance um, or we may use just the setting of the US Open if that's what they're training for. And I'll have them watch this and, and, and this little picture actually turns into a video that plays. And, and I'll have them create their resonance state while watching it. But the first thing we do is we watch it. And what's amazing is you can read the heart rate line to understand what's happening physiologically in their body to, to anticipate where, where they're apt to get stuck. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we'll, we'll go through and, and then we'll mark the, the actual places in the actual five minute span that we watch, the tennis serve, moving across the court, um, a bad call from a ref to see what their physiology does and actually be able to train specific instances. So then, then we'll play the tape and we'll practice actually creating the physiological response that's desired for it and practice through repetition. The heart is a what? It's a muscle. And we're going to train it like any other muscle in the body to respond how we want under pressure. Yeah. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I think we're out of time for, for this, but I think, should we open up for questions for a few minutes? Yeah? Would anyone have any questions for any of us? Yes. Thanks very much uh, for, for a really fascinating talk. Um, my question would be, you make some very interesting points and you have a great theory about um, how to reach mastery in different disciplines, be it chess, martial arts, or a million other things you can train. But um, the markets are a slightly different beast in the sense that master of the market changes all the time and when people, I'm particularly referring to risk taking and to, to trading markets and you know something that can work for a very long period of time can then stop working and um, you know if you, if you imagine someone getting to the top of martial arts field um, and, and being static and you know if you could freeze their age at their 30s they would just stay at the top the whole time or whatever age they reached it but the markets just don't don't behave that way so my question would be what are the key ways in which your recommendations of how to learn, what are the big differences between kind of what would be the static arts and then the markets, which is a, 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 an ever-changing beast? How, how would you 
advise people differently for those two states? Yeah, I, I think it's, it, I've, I've been asked that question before, and I, I do think that there's a consistent pattern of people feeling like their art is more dynamic than, than other arts, right? And so I agree that markets are a tremendously dynamic um, discipline, but for example, let's just take the martial arts as a, par as a parallel, right? You're not, it's not like your competitors are static. It, the, the shape is always changing, right? And if you're, you're training, I mean, like an example is Marcelo Garcia. Um, I remember when he won Abu Dhabi ADCC, which is the, the premier grappling event um, in the world. It happens every two years. He, he won, um, he dominated with this back taking game. He was taking everyone's back and this incredible technical repertoire. And I was on the mats with him two days after he won and he had thrown his whole repertoire up. And he was training this whole other omoplata game. Like, and he developed this whole thing. And then he won the ADCC again two years later. With it. And so everyone was spending a year and a half studying where he was. Um, but he released it immediately afterwards. Um, and I think that, um, that there's something beautiful about embracing that state of dynamic quality in, in all of these disciplines. I think that when you're deeply, like, I, I, as deeply as I've been immersed in chess and the martial <laughs> arts, I would say that these are disciplines that are just in a, in a constant state of dynamism because everyone is studying everyone else and the rules are always changing. Um, it might seem like they're not changing, but they are. And, and, and another example of that is that when you, one of the most important things that you learn going into martial arts competition is that the rules aren't what you think they, they're going to be. I wrote about this in my book. Like I, go to, I went to world championships, and you'd show up, and like the corruption was wild. The, the dimensions of the ring were different. The judges wouldn't give you points when you won them. You, if you go into a mindset where you think you, like things have to be stuck, you're defeated. The most important breakthrough I made was training myself against dirty opponents in shifting conditions so that when I went to a world championship, I was hoping the conditions were as bad as humanly possible because I would get better in the bad conditions as opposed to worse, right? And so I was embracing, like hungering for dynamism, for change. And I think that that's a pretty universal principle. Um, so there's a lot of differences between these arts, um, but what I find, and I think it's extremely important to be mindful of them, but I, what I find most exciting is um, where they're interconnected, right? And I think that like, if you get a world-class hockey player, um, runner, ultra-marathoner, chess player, fighter, tennis player, golfer, together in the same room, if they're really at that elite level, it's amazing how they speak the same language. At a lower level, they might not. Similarly, in the martial arts, they think about, about hard style and soft style. At the low levels, these people, like, they're different, they're, they're, they look down on each other, different, like different beasts. At the highest levels, they're doing the same thing. Um, so I think that it's, it's very easy to get, in my opinion, I'm just telling you my opinion, to get stuck in the learning process by saying that all of these things are so different so these things don't apply, but I think it's, it, it's very interesting to cultivate the, 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 the art of finding meta principles that connect them, right? And that's, a, that's the, the arts of deconstruction and the search for the highest order principle where the fibers actually do connect these things are, are are my way of life. And, and I think that um, there are differences between all these things, but I think that there are many more essential similarities. And dynamism at the is at the center of all of them, in, in, my, in my opinion. Yeah. Yes. First of all, thank you very much. And how would you train people to get better at using empty space, at being in empty space? Like you were talking earlier about it took you a long time to reach the decision to do nothing. And it reminded me of empty space, as you often talk about. And I was wondering how you train that, how you train to be okay with the empty space or the Taoist philosophy of non-doing, I would say, probably, or non-action. Yeah, that's a great question. I think that there's technical answers to that and there's somatic answers to that. On, on a, I, I do feel that most people haven't cultivated the art at watching the space left behind, right? And it's an amazing edge in a discipline, right? Like if someone is going from here to here, well, everyone's looking at where they're going as opposed to where they're leaving behind. But you can fill that space, and it's unbelievable what happens, right? Um, so, so cultivating, again, this like meta skill of, of observing empty space. People don't see emptiness, they see fullness. And there's a tremendous edge in cultivating that. Now, how do you do that? Well, I think it's very powerful to practice disciplines that are rooted in that. Right? So like Tai Chi, Tai Chi practice, which I've been doing for a couple decades, is rooted in the undulation between fullness and emptiness. 
right? Um, energetically, every motion, like when you're expanding with fullness here, you're, you're releasing here, right? And so you're, you're, you're practicing the physical embodiment of these things. I think very often people get too intellectual about these things, and they think about how can I do this in the critical moment? I don't really believe you can do anything in the critical moment if you don't train at it as a way of life. And so I look for the little moments to train it. So I would think about what would be a discipline um, that I could study. Is it Tai Chi Chuan? Is it Aikido? Which is a beautiful manifestation of a similar principle, but not with, with someone who isn't really taking themselves on, because there's a lot of charlatans in both of these worlds, but some, so someone who's really doing it, right? How can I, or, or meditation is a beautiful um, exploration of emptiness. So what's a discipline that I can do every day of my life as a breath pattern? that will deepen my ability to, to harness the power of empty space. And then when the heat's on in a critical decision-making moment or a physical confrontation or whatever, it's our breath pattern, and it's right there. So I, I, I really look for, for, like the way I relate to learning in general is I think about a, a, a theme I want to work on, then I think about what are the habits or skills through which I can practice that theme as a way of life, and I just do it all the time, and then the theme gets internalized, and then all of the manifestations of the theme become just, my, like, they're in my blood. Um, so I would think about what are the arts, and those are some that practice this. But it's also a beautiful, I mean, it's amazing edge in, walk, in just studying the space left behind by people. It, it's, um, yes? My pleasure. Well, thanks, everyone, first of all. Um, I feel I have like 20,000 questions, so I'll just ask one. Um, Josh, you, uh, you have a foundation, uh, I think, yes. or you work with children. Um, and there is a topic around learning and children, which, in my <coughs> opinion, and actually not just with children, it doesn't get enough um, attention in society, which is um, how trauma, um, developmental trauma, can, uh, can affect the ability of children to learn. And, uh, and it's very much connected to topics that are dear to you, which are sort of that interconnection between body and mind, and uh, <clears throat> yeah, I just wonder how, how you think about that topic of sort of connecting, um, well, physical activity with cognitive learning, or how yeah. it can facilitate. Well, I, I can tell you honestly, I, I'd be happy to tell you how I've trained myself around my trauma, um, but to be perfectly frank, Tr working with other people in trauma is much more in Dr. Lagos's power zone. So maybe I'll, maybe you'd like to respond to this. Yeah. There is a specialty area of neurofeedback. This is biofeedback through the heart, but neurofeedback is through training actual frequencies of electrical activity in the brain. And there is a specialist. She's one of the pioneers in the area of developmental trauma. Um, with really high efficacy rates working with kids to help enhance learning. So her name is Saburn Fisher, um, and, and she's, <coughs> she's published a tremendous amount of work in the area, so it may be a reference for you. Um, but but we, we can change how our brain actually reacts and responds to trauma, allowing for the fear response, which can inhibit learning, to subside. Um, and, and that's what her work focuses around. I can't speak to this as eloquently as she can relative to, to children and other people because this isn't what I do. I can tell you myself, I go into my trauma. <laughs> That's my way of life. Like I, I, whenever I find, if I have a fear, I go into it. I had a, a really powerful near-death experience um, making a big mistake with breath hold work um, a couple of years ago. And um, it was probably the most but it's one of the most traumatic things that ever happened, maybe the most traumatic thing that ever happened to me. And I was back in the water three, like two days after I got out of the hospital, and now I'm taking on big wave surfing. Um, so, like, I mean, it's a big part of, of for, in, for myself. Um, I get back on the horse, and I, I, I try to work right through the trauma and turn what could be a weakness for the rest of my life into a core strength. That's how I've personally navigated this. With, weak, with, with painful losses, um, with... I mean, it's interesting that most lessons learned from the biggest losses of my life have been the lessons that have won me the, the, the biggest, like, the most painful loss in the under-18 World Chess Championship taught me the lesson that won me the 2004 World Championship in the martial arts. And, like, that pattern has been through my life, but that's just my own personal approach. It's just <laughs> chase the trauma. Yeah, for me. Um, 
Can we get this? So, so, yes. Uh, thank you very much, first of all. Um, one question, I'm fairly new to this, like life philosophies of self mass like improved self-mastery, self-improvement. And I feel I came to it at a relatively later stage. And uh, I've been raised in a very fixed mindset uh, type of environment. Now I'm trying to at the same time learn it whilst trying to build my own company, whilst trying to improve so many different things at the same time, that it seems to just become uh, a ca chaos in, in my mind. So the question is, where would you start if you, I mean, you obviously have been learning these things from a very young age. Uh, where would you start and what's the best way to think about this? Did you say callous, <coughs> calloused in my mind? Is that what you said? Chaos. Chaos, chaos. chaos in my mind. Sorry. Okay, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, <laughs> the way I would approach it would be to start with a handful of, of components of your life where you're extremely mindful about having patterns that are embracing the language and the way of life that are based on, on incremental theory of intelligence. Um, I think that our self-talk, I think that, do you have children? No. Yeah. Um, I think the you have a company that you have employees? Uh, Co-founders. Co-founders. Um, I mean, so what are, the, what are the components of training? There's habits, there's habit creation, and there's a feedback loop, and there's deliberate practice based on what we observe, right? So essentially, I would create feedback loops around you based on this principle and inform who can give you feedback about what you're working on. I would have habits where you're practicing mindfulness um, around, around process with yourself and others, process-oriented language. I think you should read the book Mindset by Carol Dweck. Have you read it? No. It's an interesting book to read, which is about the... I mean, chapter two of my book gives a bit, bit of an overview with my take on this thing. But I'm yes, um, the the so there's a, like there's a little of that in there, but but I think that that you could you could study the work and think about what are the manifestations of this, and they're often very subtle. You know, anytime we, our self talk, when we have a fixed theory of intelligence, our self talk um, can, can just be paralyzing, and we can, we can kind of slip beneath our radar. You know, I can't do this. I'm good at this. It's often the positive side which is most insidious, right? I'm excellent at math. You know, I'm good with people. I'm bad with people. I'm an introvert. I'm an extrovert. I'm this. I'm that. These labels, right? As opposed to seeing any of them as malleable, things that we can play with. You know, I really believe in embracing malleability, relativity, <coughs> dynamism as opposed to the static. So I think you could think about the themes of the dynamic versus the static, take on habit creation around core. I also think that learning a discipline is a tremendous way to do this kind of thing. So take on an art where you don't have baggage, which is associated with a fixed theory of intelligence, whether it's rock climbing, for example. You could take on, or, or biking, um, or anything, right? Take on a discipline that you're mental or physical, and learn it from the ground up. And, and just be fiercely dedicated to cultivating a developmental mindset within that discipline. And then have that amplify throughout your life, right? Little by little. I think that we can, we, it's very important not to have a fixed theory of intelligence about our fixed theory of intelligence, right? And then like to have that recognition and then to devote yourself to incrementally shifting it along the spectrum. And then it's amazing what can happen with practice. It's mind-boggling what can happen with practice. People don't practice and they don't build feedback loops into their practice process. And that metaphor of the martial artist who can you know, play in spaces people can't see or the illusionist who can just make things appear before you, because that is practice, right? So that shift from fixed, to, it, it's just so doable. And embrace that, first of all, and then build it into your lifestyle. It'll be there. Yeah. Last question? Yes. Um, you have a question? Uh, yes. Hi, Josh. Hey, I'm really interested in the concept of investment and loss. And I was wondering, how do you maintain this mentality of being open to the possibility of failure or loss when in a, when in a situation of intense pressure or expectation, for example, going into the national championships as the favorite to win. Yeah. This is being asked by a world-class skater, um, hopefully on her way to the Olympics. Um, so you're really good at this, I know already. My own relationship to this, you know, it's, it's very hard. OK, so let's just say that we have the pattern, that many people have the pattern, like I do, of devastating losses and moments of deep disappointment years later leading to the greatest insights and wins of our life, right? So the question is, 
wouldn't it be liberating to, in that moment of, of, of pain, to also understand that this is inevitably going to lead to just tremendous insight that's going to unleash us. And then when we're going into this competition, laying our heart on the line, being all in on it, but understanding that, that the lessons learned from it, if, if it doesn't work for us, will be what fuel our growth and having the sense of inevitability of success running through us. I think that's a really liberating thing. It's very hard for people to, to embody that, right? And I also think that people often take that and go too far with it. And they say, it doesn't matter if I win or lose. And so they don't fully engage, right? And so it's a very... Like you need to fully engage, put your heart all in, fully commit to everything you do, as I know you do, and and also understand that the disappointments are going to give us our greatest insights. Um, and that's a liberating, it's it's a really liberating mindset. It, it's it, it again to me that feels like a dynamic mindset versus a static one. And and like the pain when we when we lay our heart on the line as a competitor, we feel pain that most people don't feel. Who are, you know, because they're not all in. And when you're all in, and you, it opens up these deep reservoirs of human experience that I know that you know, right? The emotions run so deep when we, like as a, if, as a competitor, as a chess player, if I train, you know, as a way of life for decades and then I'm competing against them in a national championship or world championship and they just defeat me, it's shattering, right? Um, but it's life. It's beautiful. It's potent. It's, it's, there's something ecstatic about living life that fully. Um, and there's also an inevitability that's going to lead to just tremendous insight. So somehow having perspective on that, um, but not too much perspective they don't feel the pain, because I think the pain is part of what fuels it. And I think like all these things, it's gray, right? Like I think we have to not be absolute about these things. Um, that's an important principle for me as well, not being academic about like the entity versus, theor versus incremental theory of intelligence. I've seen so many like by the book parents in New York City, for example, just embrace this, go way too far with it and tell kids, it doesn't matter if you win or lose, it doesn't matter, what you, it doesn't matter. And the kids never engage, because it doesn't matter, right? They've gone too far with it. And I think we need to like, really feel the tension points of these things and be present to them. In my opinion, Lila, you're just crushing that principle, by the way. So you asked about it, but I think you're right on with it. Yeah. Um, yes, thank you guys so much.